I'm calling to order this meeting of the Council of the Town of Oakville, and I invite everyone to rise and join Council in singing O Canada. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Uh, Madam Clerk, we have no regrets this evening. Council, do we have any declarations of pecuniary interest? I see none. Uh, Council, you have the addendum which lists uh, the special council meeting of 11th January as an additional set of minutes. So you have five sets of minutes to approve. Councilor Duddick is moving approval. Do I have a second? Councillor Giddings, thank you all in favor. Opposed, if any, and the minutes are adopted. We have a, um, a bit of a public presentation to give, and I'd like to um, ask if uh, Claudia Connor is here from Wellspring. Oh, good. Um, this is um, a proclamation establishing February as Wellspring Care Month, and I'll just read it. Whereas the latest cancer statistics tell us about two in five Canadians will develop cancer in their lifetimes, and whereas high incidence rates mean everyone knows someone who has been touched by cancer, and whereas Wellspring Birmingham Gilgan House provides professional programs to meet the emotional, social, spiritual, restorative, and practical needs of people living with cancer, and whereas Wellspring's focus is on individuals with cancer, their families and caregivers, ensuring that no one has to face cancer alone, therefore I, Rob Burton, Mayor of the Town of Oakville, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2016 as Wellspring Care Month in the Town of Oakville. And I invite Ms. Connor to come forward to receive a framed copy of the proclamation. And I would invite Council to join us in the center down here for a photograph. Come on, I'll snuggle. Come on. I think everyone in Oakville appreciates the outstanding service provided by Wellspring, and thank you for, uh, for, for all of that. Now, uh, Council, we have the uh, uh, Standing Committee reports uh, that you've reviewed and participated in. Uh, do we have a mover and seconder for them? Councillor Hutchins, Councillor Lischina, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, and the committee reports are adopted. Um, now, Council, I propose to dispatch the rest of the agenda so that we can devote the evening to the main 
items that are before us here. And so given that the, uh, the first discussion item is really just an announcement, uh, can I have a mover and seconder to, for the staff recommendation? Councillor Hutchins and uh, Councillor Knoll, all those in favor? Opposed, if any, and that is received. And then, uh, Councillor Robinson, is it your wish to move confidential discussion item C1? Thank you. I need a seconder for that. Councillor Lapworth, all those in favor? Opposed, if any. Uh, now, let me look in the audience. Is, uh, is uh, Brian here? Mr. Green? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to announce that Council has been able to promote from within and has just appointed Brian Durden, the, the um, Chief of Oakville Fire. As of June 1st. Now, Madam Clerk, have I overlooked anything? We did number one, we did C1. Um, oh, there's one other bit. You, you, you've got a notice of motion from councillors, I think, Adams and O'Meara. And um, really, uh, I think we should just waive the procedure bylaw and pass it tonight since it's totally non-controversial. So can I have a mover? I'll assume that councillors Adams and O'Meara are moving, waiving the procedure bylaw, and I'll ask for a vote for that. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. And now we'll put the motion to change the meeting date to um, move the council meeting off of Halloween. Everyone with kids will understand exactly what we're doing. All those in favor? Opposed, if any. And there you go. The, the minor stuff is now out of the way. And that allows us to turn to the uh, discussion item number two and the rest. Now, uh, we normally have a noon cutoff but uh, for delegations, but I want to make sure that everyone who, who wants to speak on this can speak on it. So I'm looking for a mover and a seconder for the following motion. That in accordance with section 3.4 of the procedure bylaw, permission be given to permit persons whose name does not appear on tonight's council agenda as a delegation to be heard regarding item two, townwide planning studies and an interim control bylaw for the Glen Abbey golf course. I need a mover and seconder. Councillor Hutchins and Councillor Giddings, all those in favor? Opposed, if any. And what this means is I will poll the audience after we've heard from the listed delegations in case there is anyone else who wishes to bring information to the attention of council. The point of a delegation is to uh, make sure that council has uh, all the necessary information to make a good planning decision. And with that, I think I'll recognize the town manager to start things off. Uh, thank you, Mayor Burton. I'd like to uh, call to the podium uh, Mark Simeone, our planning director of planning, who will walk you through a presentation. The uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Your Worship, and uh, members of council. I'm here tonight to give you a presentation on a proposed townwide uh, planning studies in support of an interim control bylaw for the Glen Abbey Golf Course lands. I'm just going to give you a quick overview. There's a number of key points, and I thought it was a good idea for us to give you a sense of where the discussion was going tonight. We're we'll talking a little bit about Planning Act requirements, specifically conformity of local plans uh, to the provincial objective of providing orderly growth uh, at the local level. We're going to talk about the Glen Abbey pre-consultation, which was held in November. The staff identification of the need for three studies to support uh, a go-forward position. Um, the planning analysis vis-a-vis -vis the Planning Act, the Regional Plan, and of course the Livable Oakville Plan. Uh, we'll talk about what an interim control bylaw is and how it can help the town in this uh, regard and then recommendations from staff uh, respecting the, the, the analysis. So as I said, um, 
starting with the Planning Act. Uh, basically, the Planning Act provides the town the tools to manage growth in alignment with certain provincial objectives. Uh, these are key to the town's uh, go forward position from an gro orderly growth management standpoint. Uh, the Planning Act requires local municipalities' decisions to be consistent with the P provincial planning policy statements of 2014. The Planning Act also requires local growth plans to conform with the growth plan itself as amended. And the Planning Act requires municipalities to review their official plans every five years. As you know, Livable Oakville's five-year review is currently underway as of May of last year. So here we are with pre-consultation. I'll take a moment for those who are not familiar. Pre-consultation is a mandatory provision of the Planning Act when your official plan and you have a bylaw in effect. That requires uh, developers to propose certain developments within, within a municipality to pre-consult with uh, members of staff regarding their proposal. In, with respect to Oakville, it's a mandatory requirement when there's an official plan amendment uh, proposed, a zoning bylaw amendment, or a draft plan of subdivision. Um, so staff held a pre-consultation meeting with representatives of the Glen Abbey course through uh, Club Link in November of 2015. Um, representatives from the region were there, uh, the town, applicants, agents, Conservation Halton, and we had about an hour and a half to somewhere in that order, uh, this presentation by the applicants, agents with respect to the proposal, which you can see on the screen and uh, question and answers about what would be necessary to go forward, with, which is what's called a complete application. And just so you can see it, we were provided information regarding a 3,000 to approximately 3,200 residential unit development, 70 to 80 to 90,000 square feet of new office, and 70,000 to 80,000 square feet of new retail on the Glen Abbey golf course site. Golf course site sorry. Uh, in support of that, through the uh, pre-consultation, staff identified the need for 38 studies uh, that were required in order to consider the application complete. 19 of these studies were identified as unique to the site itself. These were issues of proposal and unique characteristics of the site. In the pre-consultation, three studies were identified that were necessary to occur. Planning justification report, uh, looking at the establishment of a new growth area and the impact on planned function, a cultural heritage landscape assessment and an economic or land use economic impact uh, identified during pre-consultation. During the uh, preparation of the terms of reference, we decided, as you recall, 19 studies were unique. So in other words, 38 of the studies minus 19, you could go to the town's website and say these studies, just read the website, those terms of reference are what you have to do. 19 of them are going to be unique. So we had to identify um, uh, unique terms of reference for each and every one. In the course of doing that, we identified the fact that the proposal to redevelop uh, Glen Abbey in accordance with the pre-consultation information would in fact establish the third largest growth node in the town of Oakville. Um, when you think about it, Livable Oakville says that in the long term the plan, from a planning standpoint, is for the Glen Abbey to remain a golf course, not a growth node. And livable Oakville's growth strategy relies on protecting stable residential areas, and it does that by directing growth to the growth areas. And so looking at this uh, in assessment of it and in consul, um, concert with the idea of developing terms of reference, we became of increasingly of the view that we needed to study this comprehensively on a town-wide basis. So I'll talk a little bit about the study we're referring to as an urban structure review. Uh, we see it as part of the five-year comprehensive plan review that uh, uh, Oakville is currently doing with respect to livable Oakville. And essentially, it'll ask ourselves, where do we want to grow? Where should we grow? We have six growth nodes we've identified now. Is, in the example of Glen Abbey, is this to be the seventh growth node? In the context of that study, we will look at things like population projections, having in mind uh, requirements of the region and the growth plan to certain population outcomes by 2041. We'll look at the locational assessment of the existing growth areas vis-a-vis -vis any proposed growth areas. And also the relationship between the growth areas and municipal infrastructure. If you think back, we've had those growth centers for a number of years now. Both private and public sector investments have been made in infrastructure. We need to understand those relationships as we go forward. In addition, uh, we need to maintain conformity with the provincial requirements of the PPS and so on, and of course the regional plan. 
We would like to confirm the desired land use pattern across Oakville, preserve the, sta the stability of the residential neighborhoods, and certainly understand the impacts of the planned function of Glen Abbey becomes a growth center, and the growth center in the context of the entire town. Um, we also want to consider a land use economic impact analysis. So from a standpoint of staff, we see that Glen Abbey has a role in terms of the town's overall economic structure. There are obviously and is a relationship between that role and land use patterns. The current planned economic, uh, we need to understand the current and the planned function. The current use is that of a golf course with additional uses which would allow it to become an even better golf destination. And the zoning speaks to things like a hotel and, and development of things of that nature to support the uh, enjoyment of golf. Um, it's a little bit of background on the cultural heritage landscape study. Town or staff feel that uh, this is an important uh, study also to undertake. And the, I should remind town council that the steps to do that have already been taken. Uh, back in January of 2014, council adopted the cultural heritage landscape strategy. And as part of that, it saw three phases going forward. One was the um, a, a inventory of what's out there and then an assessment and research of, of those properties at a higher significance. And then if any and were deemed to be important, there would be a move to protect those that were there, that were identified. In um, just last week at the, at the Heritage Committee, uh, Heritage Committee did deal with the results of the phase, uh, phase one study, the inventory. In the phase one study, uh, the Glen Abbey Golf Course lands in its entirety were identified as one of eight high priority areas high priority areas that need to go forward with further review and assessment to determine whether or not they meet the tests of a cultural heritage landscape. And at this time, no decisions have been made other than to do that further analysis. Talk about the planning analysis in terms of this. We consider the uh, section 26, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a part of the planning act that deals with official plan amendments in the context of the five year review cycle. Um, specifically, it tells municipalities and only municipalities, that when they're doing their five-year review, they have to have regard for matters of provincial interest. Matters of provincial interest include the orderly development of communities and growth centers. And we must um, keep our, our, our official plans in line with the objectives of, of the province through, the, through the, growth and, uh, the growth plan as well as the uh, provincial policy statements. This is something that the town must undertake on its own. Coming down to the next level, we look at the region of Halton official plan. The region of Halton official plan and the town's plan, they have to conform, and all of them have to conform with provincial objectives for orderly growth. There are sections in that document, 48, they're seen on the screen, 77.5, 81.3. They operate in such a way to direct a local municipality to take on certain studies when things like this are presented to it. In other words, when new growth areas are, are being considered. These cannot be done by anyone other than the town. And then we look at Livable Oakville. So we're making, moving through the hierarchy of Livable Oakville, uh, or Planning Act, down right to ourselves. Livable, Livable Oakville uh, has a bunch of, a uh, series of guiding principles. And I'll read them for you. Preserve, enhance, and protect the distinct character, cultural heritage, living environment, and sense of community neighborhoods. And to direct the majority of growth, the identified locations where higher density, transit, and pedestrian oriented development can be accommodated. So in consideration of all those matters, and I'll just kind of highlight them for us, we have a, a, an application identified through pre-consultation that looks to be a new growth area. We have provincial requirements that require municipalities to maintain orderly growth when they're considering the development of, of the communities in Ontario. We have provisions in the Halton plan and our own plan that maintain and, and relate to those issues. Um, and we have specific issues with respect to uh, the preservation of the stable residential neighborhoods as a policy independent and another policy that says where you, in order to preserve those you need to direct your growth to your growth areas and those they rely on each other you can't have one without the other the stability of the residential neighborhood in part relies on the on the growth strategy currently identified so we'll talk a little bit about the tools available under the planning act that the town has to deal with such issues as this Section, specifically section 38 of the Planning Act gives a tool to council that where they need to have more information to make an informed decision upon receipt of a complete application, they can undertake necessary studies to bring that information forward when they consider that matter. They can be passed 
when, when these studies are necessary for a period of up to one year. And if there's, the information is not complete for whatever reason, they can be done for another year. And the same thing, uh, in addition to that, interim control bylaws can restrict the use to only those uses existing on the day the bylaw was passed. So if somebody comes in for, for a building permit for a use that's not listed on the day the bylaw was passed, there would be no change. And we think that's important in the context of, of Glen Abbey because we're still going through the, the assessment of the cultural heritage landscape and we don't know what the impacts will be if things change before that assessment's underway. So we need to really understand those things as a go forward position. And so with that said, we have a series of recommendations tonight in a sense that the report from planning uh, and planning department be adopted. And uh, there, it's contained in the staff report in front of you. Council initiated a town-wide urban structure review as part of the five-year review of the livable Oakville plan that is currently underway. That council initiate a land use economic and impact analysis study to examine the role of the Glen Abbey Golf Course in its existing and its planned land use function in the context of the town's economic structure and evaluate economic impact of any proposed redevelopment of the Glen Abbey Golf Course. That $300,000 be allocated to the official plan capital project to be funded 90% from development charges and 10% from the capital reserve in order to complete both the urban structure review and the land use economic and impact analysis study. That Macaulay Shiomi House and Limited be single sourced as a lead consultant to undertake the urban structure review. That within phase two of the cultural heritage landscape strategy implementation, the assessment of the Glen, Glen Abbey Golf Course be given the highest priority in terms of its timing. And that interim control bylaw 2016-024 is attached to the report from the Planning Services Department entitled Townwide Planning Studies and Interim Control Bylaw for the Glen Abbey Golf Course. Be passed to restrict the use of the Glen Abbey Golf Course to the existing uses only for a period of one year pending the completion of the following studies. A, an urban structure review. B, a land use economic and impact analysis study and see the cultural heritage landscape assessment of the Glen Abbey Golf Course. Now, Your Worship, that completes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Director. Um, Council, if you have, uh, who, by show of hands, who has questions? Oh, well then why don't I start at the end and we'll just go across. And that way I can't possibly get confused. Councilor Lischina. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Semioni, for that presentation. <clears throat> uh, you discussed uh, the three studies, um, the urban structure review, land use, economic impact analysis, and cultural heritage landscape strategy. Um, are you confident that these uh, studies that are proposed are um, consistent with the reasons outlined in Section 38 of the uh, Ontario Planning Act? Um, as to why a municipality would uh, would pass an interim control bylaw? Um, uh, yes, I am through you, Your Worship. The, the act is clear. Municipalities are entitled to use a tool to take a pause in terms of moving forward on a decision basis when they, f they feel they don't have all the information necessary to, to uh, make an informed decision on a, on a project. It's our view, based on the uh, review of the application and the, the uh, requirements of a complete application as contained in Livable Oakville, that the tools of the Planning Act and the Livable Oakville work very well together, and I think these three studies are what's required to move forward. Councillor Adams. I have uh, two, two questions. One's a really short one, and that is we have a memo before us that uh, provides a revision to part seven here. Um, is that intended to occur? Uh, through you, Your Worship, I believe the memo revision is referenced to this uh, exchange of Schedule A, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sorry? I, it's, the memo is exchanging Schedule A to the bylaw? Yes. Yes, I, that's intended to occur. So just in, in item number seven, it's meant to be um, as revised in accordance with the memo from dated February 1st. Through Your Worship, that's correct. Yes, Councilor. okay. I just want to make sure that occurs properly. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the, um, in the creation of Livable Oakville, we had thousands of people who took part in the review of that uh, process, maybe as many as 10,000. During all of that, did we have discussions regarding the future use of the Glen Abbey lands? Uh, 
I'll, I'll start the question with the answer that I think is true. Yes, we would have talked about every and anything and everything. I'll ask Ms. Closey to come in after, but the uh, typically public participation is a hallmark of any land use planning process. Uh, when we see status quo outcomes or no changes, often we assume that that was the intended output and outcome from that discussion point. So given but, the... But uh, let me help the director out here. The, his, his awkward, his, the reason he feels awkward is he wasn't here for, for that. So maybe, Madam, Madam you. Commissioner, you were. Russ, we'll, we'll jump to you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, the designation of uh, the Glen Abbey was considered as part of the livable Oakville uh, process. It was de designated as private open space, which permits the uses that, that are there. <coughs> it also uh, reflected the specific provisions in the official plan that allowed for the hotel and those other complementary provisions within the official plan. So that was considered and specifically built into the, uh, the, the livable Oakville plan. Uh, there was no discussion about it through the process, so um, there wasn't an objection or concern raised from anyone about those designations, um, but certainly it was considered as part of that process. Including the landowners, I presume. Oh, of course, yes. Thank you. Councillor Grant. Thank you. Um, just uh, when you got to the conclusion of this, you'd mentioned... Uh, uh, actually, it's item number seven, uh, for a period of one year pending the completion of the following studies. We, uh, we always like to give people a measure of comfort that something is coming in, in at least a, a reasonable amount of time. How long do you think these three studies would actually take? Um, well, as long as it takes and is practical. However, uh, you'll note in the staff report to you, Your Worship, that we've identified a single source one. We're understanding that time is of essence. We've taken the trouble to identify a service provider in that regard to, to move things along. Um, with respect to the land use economic and impact analysis, it's kind of a different one given the golf side of it, and it's going to take us a, a little bit longer to identify the appropriate um, uh, people to provide us that background. But to reiterate, as soon as practical, and you'll notice in the recommendation on the cultural heritage piece, we've given it the highest priority in terms of the assessments in the context of that, that review. So the answer is as soon as we can and as soon as practical. And will all the studies be coming back in one swoop, or will they be coming back piece by piece? Um, well, through your worship, I'd like to, there is a relationship overall to the to the other because now they're in all part of the official plans. There will be some need for the, some of them to interact, perhaps not the cultural heritage piece, but certainly the urban structure piece and the um, land use piece across the economic side of the thing. So we're, there may be some parts of that process that that take it on different journeys. But as soon as we can, we'll bring them back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Councillor Noel. Thank you, Worship. Um, as you mentioned several times in your presentation, uh, you've indicated the fact that uh, we've already sort of taken the first uh, um, step in the planning process through the, uh, the initial consultation, uh, that, that the pre-consultation that happened. Um, I'm curious as to how the fact that we have actually started that process impacts um, what we might be passing here tonight and vice versa. How does this affect that? So how does, the, how, does, how does one affect the other? Sounds like a legal question. If I might, uh, through Town you. Town solicitor, Mr. Carr. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, through you, Mayor uh, Burton. The, uh, the interim control bylaw would operate effectively to put a hold on the town's uh, decision-making process while it undertook the studies and came back with the uh, uh, the recommended policies. Does that mean that the, um, the internal processes uh, would be stopped as well, so the, the review of the materials that are being submitted as to support the actual application? Yes, through you, Your Mayor, pending the, uh, the completion of the studies. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Lapworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question is associated with 7B, as we see on the screen right now, and it goes like this. How will the outcome of the land use economic use study influence future potential uses of the land? Uh, through you, Mayor Burton, to uh, Councillor Lapworth. Um, the study on the uh, economic um, study is certainly going to be uh, jointly carried out with the Economic Development Department. And it will look at what is the existing plan function of uh, Glen Abbey at this point in time, as well as it has permissions on it in terms of other uses that can create more of a, 
a destination golf course, so it's trying to understand that role, which are its current plan function um, in relation to the town's overall economic uh, importance. And both of those things will then be taken into consideration so that we can then evaluate any change in the land use that's there. So that's the scope of that study uh, that would be undertaken. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Elgar. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, you for the presentation. I would ask if uh, I could have a co hard copy of the presentation that you've just presented to everybody tonight. Um, some of my questions have been answered. I may p play clean up at the end, but I uh, understand everybody over on that side had their hands up also. So my questions are uh, pretty simple. The Glen Abbey Golf Course opened in 1976 and has been identified as one of the most significant events in Oakville's history. But the site has a long history prior to opening of the Glen Abbey Golf Course. And I would like to know if the Cultural Heritage Landscape Strategy Study will take the full history of the site into account when it's, before it's completed. Will this be done completely for all the history of the golf course as we know it? Thank you, through your worship to the councillor. Yes, uh, councillor, it will go back, I believe it started approximately 1814. I'm, I'm looking at a date somewhere about that, the earliest known use of the property. And uh, it certainly would be appropriate to thoroughly understand the site and how it started and how it's changed and how it's arrived to our time. And it'll include uh, all the uses and the people that live there and the events that have occurred, things of that nature, buildings on the site. I note that there's a, a, a the Radar Manor is one, one of the buildings on site is currently designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. So there are important elements that we need to understand and, and those relationships over the fullness of time. Okay, I thank you for the thoroughness you're going to do in this, complete, this study. Thanks. I may ask uh, questions later, but I'm going to wait. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hutchins? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Grant actually asked the question I had thought to ask as well. But it, since you answered that, um, I'd like to also ask, uh, how is the public going to be able to participate in all this? I mean, we uh, pride ourselves in going out and talking to the public on just about everything. So this is obviously a very important thing. So how are they going to be participating? How often? Thank you, through you, your worship, to the Councillor. Um, as I said earlier, public participation is like a key foundation of any planning process. And there are some certain minimums that are required under statute, but we have far more success when we, we open up the process and are, uh, allow ourselves to be more flexible in terms of community needs. Uh, we can hold events anywhere in the town that's required upon request. We're certainly going to be taking back uh, uh, revisions to our current planning uh, cycle and what we had planned in terms of meetings, and now we have to factor these in. So I guess the answer to you will be, there will be more opportunities, and as many opportunities are required to get the information that council needs. So th these will be plenty of notice and uh, advanced notice for, for, for everybody to Everybody to say. be involved, the, the app, you know, landowners, uh, there's no, no, no restriction really. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Giddings? Uh, Commissioner? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I was just going to add that in terms of the Livable Oakville process, it was on a very extensive public consultation, and we've undertaken those similar processes in all of the planning studies. So these studies would be subject to the same type of full public consultation with the community. Thank you very much. Ah, and I would also note that Council okay. at the last Planning and Development Council meeting established a subcommittee of Livable Oakville, which is another opportunity to get information out there in terms of what is happening. Okay, thank you. It, it might take longer to pass planning propositions in Oakville, but at least everybody gets a say. Councillor Giddings. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Simeone, Simeone, could you go back to chart 14 or page 14 of your presentation? I had a question following up on uh, Councillor Knowles' question and the Which answer from our solicitor Carr. Which one was 14, Councillor? I don't have, I can't find the number. Bottom left, you're at five. I'm at five? Six. Six seven, eight. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, there we are. Perfect. <laughs> you talked about Section 38 of the Planning Act. Uh, why does the town consider the interim control bylaw that's before us this evening to be the appropriate tool in this situation? Uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, to the Councillor, well, there's two elements in play, at least in my mind. One is time, 
and, and one is the fact that, or the need for studies, and the other one is the fact that we're doing a, um, um, a review right now that we need to bring this into. So the planning, uh, Section 38 allows us to, to do studies and at the same time put a pause in terms of any development that may occur on the property. And it, to, in my view, it's the appropriate part of the Planning Act for us to, to use this tool. We can, we can sort of freeze that property in time while we take the studies that are necessary. And that's exactly what the, the Act provides for us to do. And in this case, as a result of the five-year review, it'll be concurrent? Well, the five-year review is just happens to be going on and it's useful because we're looking at the issues of growth management overall. So it's, it's, it's coincidentally timely that that's happening because we can bring that, that information into this process and, and further inform both processes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Giddings. Councillor Dedek. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. Um, I was pleased to hear the question uh, across the floor in regards to the timing. That was a concern I had as well. Um, under your uh, recommendations, you've got in item six that within phase two of the cultural heritage landscape strategy implementation, as you cited during your presentation, um, Councillor Hutchins and myself were at that January 26 Heritage Committee meeting and we had a quite extensive discussion, very well attended by members within the community. And um, as you pointed out, it was this particular property was cited as being one of eight um, as under high priority properties. And I guess my question is, why are not the others also being, you know, given this heightened uh, priority in terms of going forward for assessment? Um, thank you, through your worship to the councillor. Um, so some of the properties are owned by the town themselves, so, or, or ourselves. So in that regard, we can control um, things that we can control. So we, we understand that. Some are rural properties, and we don't see any development is imminent there. And this is the only one where we've had a pre-consultation on of this scale. We haven't even had a conversation with the other private landowners that I'm aware of, certainly not at the level of pre-consultation. If some pre-consultations came in, we would have the similar analysis on the rebalance of the properties and potentially could be back here on, on other properties if that was to occur. Okay, because that's what my understanding was when we were discussing it at Heritage was the fact that similar to our properties of interest for the Heritage designated properties, um, as things progress, that sort of bumps the, uh, the process in terms of the priority of the application. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Dudek. Um, Councillor Robinson, given your, your uh, laryngitis, I'm, I'm uh, worried that you might not be able to voice a question. Would you like to pass? Thank you. Councillor O'Meara. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director. And, and uh, I'd just like to say, um, Commissioner Closey, as well, that over my brief year or so of uh, being on council here, um, it never once dawned on me the amount of, of uh, planning that I would have to know or, or become. I, I won't get the accreditation like you guys, but uh, just in case there are a few uh, hopefuls out in the audience thinking about filling a vacant seat, just be prepared to get your planning degrees as well. Um, one, of, one of the things that I'm seeking to try and understand, and I tried to do a bit of research on it and uh, um, couldn't come up with the answer that satisfied me, was a re the difference between a cultural heritage landscape and the heritage registry. I mean, we deal with that all the time, but I'm wondering what the difference is between those two. And, and I mean, they both revolve around a cultural element. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on that for me. Um, through your, your worship to the councillor, perhaps commissioner can jump in if I misstep Spoik on this. So cultural heritage landscapes speak to um, that culture and, and heritage and a landscape. So it can include an open field, um, a, a view shed that's a, some sort of historical significance. And it's once it's been identified through an inventory, you, you, you check out through a community all the things that are candidates for such a designation, then you would move it to register and designate the property. The cultural heritage or a heritage registry is, is a listing of designated properties, as, as I understand it. Things that have gone through a process and like a building at this location is identified as it's on the heritage register. So you're telling me it's a bricks and mortars difference? The bricks and mortars can be included in the context of a cultural heritage landscape, but, but not necessarily. They can just be open space or a combination of buildings and spaces that might have some sort of cultural significance. 
So it's, it's more than just bricks and mortar. It can open up the definition of culture and heritage. Okay, a little wider envelope then, I guess. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Add uh, one piece to that is the cultural heritage landscape is a new element that's just really been put into the a few years ago under the provincial planning um, a provincial policy statement actually and that's why we had done the cultural heritage landscape strategy as part of the um, previous work that you saw in January of 2014 was to understand how the town goes forward on its cultural heritage landscape. And as Mark said, landscape is much broader, as you had indicated as well. The heritage registry is typically a building. Um, that's how we've treated it in the past. That's how the planning, uh, the uh, Heritage Act treats it. Whereas cultural heritage landscape is a policy framework, a planning policy framework that provides the broader scope to look at the lands and how the lands contribute to the culture, not just the building. And if I may add, things like a historic battlefield, something like that. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Council, uh, I'm at your service, but if you have no further questions at this time, I propose to uh, go to the registered delegations and then poll the audience. Councillor Chenna. Thank you. Uh, just a follow-up question. So when you said 19 studies are unique to the site and you picked the three, does that mean the rest aren't necessary? Um, through your worship, no. Uh, thank you for allowing me to clarify that, Councillor. No, the the th the states that the, the three that I, I identified were identified to the uh, owners' representatives at the pre-consultation meeting. So when we sat down with them, we had said a planning justification, an economic impact, and a cultural heritage were part of them. And I pulled those out and said. These are, have broader implications, <laughs> at least two of them are broadly implicated on a town-wide basis and in part need to be connected to our official plan review. The other studies are more site-specific. As an example, a survey of the site is a study. And it's not really that same significance in terms of uh, that. I'm not far, uh, as far along as Councillor O'Meara. I've just got the six months under the belt with the Planning Act, thank you. <laughs> Well, it's well known that the best way to learn is to ask questions, so, you know, points to you. Point de Boni, uh, if, if anyone will accept that as French. Um, so, I'm going to call the list of delegations, and the first delegation is an old acquaintance of mine, Mr. Mark Flowers. I haven't seen in years, but yes, you seem to be keeping Mr. well, Mr. sir. Always happy to be back in your lovely town, though. Um, and uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. My name is Mark Flowers. I'm a lawyer with Davies Howe Partners. And uh, we represent Clublink Corporation ULC and Clublink Holdings Limited. They are the owners of the Glen Abbey lands. Uh, I'm also joined this evening by various representatives uh, of Clublink. Uh, we've reviewed the staff report from your planning services department dated January 28, 2016. Uh, we just received that on Friday. Uh, and I'm here to advise that Clublink objects to staff's recommendation that council pass an interim control bylaw for the Glen Abbey lands. <clears throat> Among other things, the proposed bylaw is one, not necessary, two, it unfairly targets this one specific property, and three, it lacks any sound planning justification. And I'll deal with each of those in turn. First, that the bylaw is unnecessary. Staff are recommending that the bylaw you just heard be passed in order to allow time for three studies to be completed uh, by the town. The town does not, however, need to enact an interim control bylaw in order to undertake any of these studies, two of which you heard are town-wide, and one of which is specific to the Glen Abbey lands. The proposed urban structure review is intended to be a component you heard of the town's on ongoing review of its official plan, which commenced in May of last year. And a five-year official plan review is intended to be a comprehensive review of the municipality's official plan. It includes, among other things, the municipality's urban structure. So as part of its review, the town should be looking at its urban structure, regardless of any specific development proposal that may come forward. And the town certainly does not need to enact an interim control bylaw to do that. Staff is also proposing that the town undertake an economic and impact analysis study, which they've estimated will cost the town $150,000. Uh, you heard that there was a pre-application consultation meeting in November. You heard that approximately 38 studies were identified that our client would have to prepare at its expense. 
And I can tell you that of those 38, two of them dealt with economic issues. One was a financial impact study. One is a market impact study, which includes, among other things, financial impacts on the town that would result from the loss of the golf course. And in the ordinary course of a development application, the town would wait until the applicant has prepared and provided those studies. The town would then review those and potentially might even retain outside uh, peer review consultants to assist in that review. If the town, however, wishes to spend taxpayer dollars to concurrently commission its own studies dealing with economic impact, I suppose that's certainly town council's prerogative. But again, there's no need to enact an interim control bylaw in order for the town to prepare such studies. Turning to the cultural heritage landscape strategy, the staff report notes that phase two will commence this month. And that's regardless of any interim control bylaw. Thus, it is apparent that there is simply no need for the proposed bylaw in order to complete that study either. Further, regarding staff's alleged concern that additional development on the Glen Abbey lands may impair cultural, hands, cultural heritage landscape values and therefore their recommendation that interim control be applied, we note that the existing permission for hotel and conference facilities up to a maximum of nine stories has existed on a portion of the Glen Abbey site since 1980. It's continued to be recognized as appropriate by the town since then, so for the last 36 years, including as recently as the comprehensive update of the town zoning bylaw just in 2014. It's also important to note that those permissions only apply to a small portion of the Glen Abbey lands, and yet the bylaw that they are recommending would apply to the site in its entirety. This also speaks to the second concern that I raised, namely that the, the proposed bylaw unfairly targets this one specific property. As the staff report notes, and as you just heard, Glen Abbey was one of eight properties that I guess just last week was identified as a so-called high priority for a second stage cultural heritage study. And all of those sites, notwithstanding what you just heard about, you know, some are under public ownership and other ones are farms and there's no, um, no development applications pending. In the staff report, it identified that those eight sites are all, and I'm using the staff words, under threat. And again, that report just came out last week. Thus, if staff were truly concerned about potential development undermining the next phase of the cultural heritage landscape study, it begs the question, why is the proposed interim control bylaw only applicable to Glen Abbey and not any of these other high priority sites? And to be clear, we're not recommending that the proposed interim control bylaw be amended to include any of those other seven high priority sites. Rather, we're pointing to that omission as further evidence that staff's alleged concern is not valid and that the recommended interim control bylaw is, with respect, misguided. Similarly, if staff truly believe that an interim control bylaw is required in order to undertake an urban structure review of either the existing or potential growth areas within the town, why would staff not be recommending that the interim control bylaw be applicable to all other lands that are subject to that review? Again, it's focused only on this one site, and therefore, given the above, it's evident that there is no legitimate planning rationale for this proposed bylaw. In fact, this conclusion is reinforced by certain statements in the staff report that appear to signal the real motives that are driving this recommendation. Ordinarily, and I've been involved with interim control bylaws certainly in other municipalities, but ordinarily, a review or study is undertaken to determine whether any changes should be made to the municipality's land use planning policies or zoning bylaws, and if so, in what manner. So you go into the process saying, we don't know whether there needs to be any changes. We need time to study it, to look at it. And in some cases, those reviews are completed, and the municipality determines, you know what? Our existing policies are just fine. Our existing bylaws are fine. We don't need to make any changes. Now, by contrast, in this instance, Staff, the staff report seems to have already predetermined the outcome. More specifically, and I draw your attention to pages 10 and 11 of the report, staff has stated that the proposed interim control bylaw will not only allow time to carry out these three studies, but also will provide time, and this is a quote, to approve amended official plan policies, which will provide for an updated land use planning policy framework against which to assess the, and properly evaluate the Glen Abbey Golf Course redevelopment proposal. 
And so for all of those reasons, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, we are urging council to reject staff recommendation number seven in its entirety. And we're also asking that you amend recommendation one such that the staff report is simply received for information rather than adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Um, are there questions for Mr. Flowers? Thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, next registered delegation is uh, Renato Dicenza. As Renato here. Yes. So, <clears throat> Renato, um, welcome to council. And as a resident, you may already know that the purpose of a delegation is to bring information to the attention of council uh, for its use in trying to make the decision before us. Well, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. And I hope to bring the perspective information of a resident. So, Mr. Mayor, fellow, trust, uh, fellow citizens, trusted councillors, and dedicated staff, I'm here to support the adoption of all items on the resolution. These recommendations essentially entail that council do the homework required to make one of the most uh, interesting decisions, perhaps, in the development and planning phase of history. It certainly is about a unique and fantastic asset we call Glen Abbey. I live on 544 Gulf View Court. I enter my neighborhood Fairway Hills in the Glen Abbey community through the Lynx Drive. So if the context is clear for you, it is certainly clear for me. My wife and I moved here after attending a Canadian Open 20 years ago and dreaming what it would be to live in a community like Oakville. 13 years ago, we had that opportunity. A consortium called, a consortium called Country Club Living, of which Club Link was a part of it, said you can live on this wonderful uh, community. We paid a handsome premium. We paid taxes based on the value of that community in the context of how it was planned and in the context of a golf course. And so did Club Link, by the way. And we were glad to do so. I'd love for you to make a decision to say tonight, Glen Abbey will stay forever. But I know you can't do that. As much as I'd love it, as much as my fellow neighbors would love it, you need to do the homework. As a business person, you're the board of directors for this town. You need the information required to assess and make this decision. We have an official plan that neither protects nor takes into account Glen Abbey as a growth area or secures it for our future. Yet we won't take the time to do the studies to assess that. The Abbey is central to Oakville. It is the most known landmark that we have in this town. In fact, I would go further to say that you shouldn't just accept the status quo, you should figure out how we take advantage in partnership with Clublink to enhance its unique value. As the pressure on vanilla golf courses increases, there'll be an opportunity for those golf courses that have the brand and the longevity of Glen Abbey to be different. In fact, it's this very phenomenon that makes us pause and think about what the unfair economic advantage we have in this town. The essence of economic development is exploiting unfair advantages, not throwing them away. The town has done a great job in livable Oakville. It took years, thousands of dollars, and perhaps tens of thousands of uh, delegations to figure out where we're going to grow and then coordinate that with regional and provincial plans. In fact, I just saw the master plan from Halton just got released. Many OMB hearings later and res resolutions in that official plan, we have something, we're reviewing it now. And yet, we're willing to say we can go and make more decisions on the third largest growth note that is nowhere reflected in this plan without further study? Interesting. So here's the tension. We have a, a club owner who wants to make this the, uh, an exceptionally large development, take years of study away and say, it's okay, we'll plop this right here. And yet we have a resident like myself and fellow residents who relied on the official plan, relied on the consultation, relied on the input and what we, when we bought our properties to say we know what we're doing. Yet all this proposal does is say, we gotta review this, let's take time, let's pause. We've come at a crossroads and we need to make a decision. In fact, don't make this decision to make me happy to adopt the recommendations. Don't make it to make Clublink happy. You need to make it to do your job. I would say that the interim control bylaw, as argued by council, effectively says has no difference. Fantastic. There's no economic hardship to Clublink. They intend to operate that for the period of two years. 
I don't think they're going to do 38 studies in a year. So in fact, if it is overkill, it may be overkill. But the fact of the matter is we need to put into place protection to take a pause and consider it. And I'd like to close by offering this observation. I had a job selling the GTA for investors internationally for years. Traveled six continents and countries around the world. I talked to companies large and small about investing here. And I can tell you whether it was a personal investment or a huge business investment, it was the unique differences that sold it to the investor. It was not about doing what every other community did, grow indiscriminately and provide no unique public or private open spaces. And when we travel somewhere, it's the great public and private spaces we think about. The spaces that are created for the residents in the community that visitors love to visit, not the other way around. We know these destinations by their unique landmarks and their institutions. We admire these places for how they have assembled the assets in a unique and sustainable way. We have many places to grow houses in Oakville. We've identified them in the livable plan. We've even made sure we're going to live up to our targets. We only have one Glen Abbey. And without sounding melodramatic, whatever decision we made will change in some way, probably significantly, the future of Oakville. The tools put in place and recommended by staff are not unreasonable to make this type of decision. So I encourage you to adopt this in all its fulsome. Do your job as the board of directors of this town. Study this and make a fair and balanced decision. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. DiCenzo. Um, I'm sorry, I, I was busy chasing a flying away sheet of paper and wasn't able to stop you applauding. Really, in a, in a matter like this, it's uh, part of our rules that we don't, uh, we don't uh, disparage speakers, nor do we applaud them in an effort to make sure that everyone feels free to speak. So I'd, I'd, I'd really love your cooperation with that tonight, uh, uh, members of the public. Um, the next uh, registered uh, dele delegation is from Janet Hazlitt Thiel, the Joshua Creek Sir, President's your, your Worship. Sir, Your Worship, I, oh, I sorry. had a question for the delegate, if that's okay. I beg your pardon. No I was so busy uh, nagging the audience not to applaud, I didn't see you. Mr. DiCenzo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, sorry, it, it'll be very uh, uh, brief, um, Mr. DeSenza. As a taxpayer in Oakville, are you okay with us spending money to, under, do, to undergo these studies? Absolutely. Do you have to do your independent due diligence? I appreciate Clublink will do their work. I need the town to rely to do its independent uh, review and assure itself of what's being taken into account. So uh, not only am I uh, okay with it, I think it would be irresponsible not to undertake given the magnitude of this decision. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now call uh, Janet Hazlitt Deal on behalf of the Joshua Creek Residents Association. Good evening. So I'm here tonight on behalf of the Joshua Creek Residents Association in regard to the townwide planning and interim control bylaw being proposed on the Glen Abbey lands. We encourage you tonight to pass this bylaw and we applaud those that have brought it forward. We think it's sound, it's justified, and it's the right thing to do. Townwide planning studies enable residents to participate and ensure their voice is heard amidst the potentially louder voices of others who may seek to overdevelop an area. Residents expect and appreciate that in matters related to issues that impact our neighborhoods and the environment that we all share, they shouldn't be rushed. The short and long-term impact of land development requires a fulsome understanding of the impact. And that's what this interim control bylaw would do from our understanding. We also want to say that we have come to you multiple times to talk about the importance of stable residential neighborhoods, protecting them, protecting the character. Well, we stand united with the Glen Abbey folks that they too should have their neighborhoods protected and the character protected. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Hazlitt Teal. Are there questions? I'll call the next registered delegation. Uh, Mr. Fraser Demoff. I just, I'm going to ask the same question for everyone who's up here to speak, so my apologies, but um, are you okay with, the, with this council approving taxpayer dollars to undergo these studies? Sure, because I expect to use taxpayer dollars to always support protect uh, neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Hold the hand up longer till I see you next time. 
Uh, Mr. Fraser Demoff. Council looks forward to your information. I'd like to uh, thank Mayor Burton Council for uh, allowing me to speak this evening. Uh, I promise not to take too much of your time. I'm here to vo voice my support for the interim uh, control bylaw being proposed this evening regarding the Glen Abbey Golf Course. Um, I'd also like to voice my vehement opposition uh, to that land ever being redeveloped and turned into a new subdivision. As many of my friends and neighbours here already know, the Glen Abbey Golf Course is a historic local treasure. And we, are a town as, we as a town are blessed uh, to have such a beautiful local gem that has offered us uh, so many years of beautiful scenery, very exciting Canadian Open tournaments, um, you know, and the occasional round of golf from time to time. The Glen Abbey Golf Course is one of the town of Oakville's greatest assets and brings tremendous economic benefits to the town, and it's not just during the Canadian Open. So we as active and engaged citizens have a responsibility to safeguard this asset so that future generations can benefit from it the way that we have. But the biggest thing is that you don't need to take my word for it because the owner of Glen Abbey Golf Course Club Link uh, would seem to agree with me. If you go to their website, they'll state that Glen Abbey Golf Course is a grand stage for golf history and that it's a world famous property. So why do they want to change it? Naturally, I find it perplexing that a developer owned by the same entity as Clublink chooses to re or is choosing to redevelop a world famous property or a piece of golf history like Glen Abbey. Remember, this is their words, not mine. Let us also not forget that an entire new subdivision where Glen Abbey currently sits would place unforeseen burdens on our roads and our transit systems, as well as the services provided by the town. These burdens would impact not just the Glen Abbey community, but the entire town of Oakville, the north and the south. In the end, the redevelopment of Glen Abbey is something that simply cannot and should not ever happen. We as active and engaged citizens have a responsibility to fight for our green space and ensure that future generations have the same access to and enjoyment that we have been so lucky to have. In closing, I would like to thank Town Council and the Mayor for work, their diligent work on this issue to date and would also like to join with my friends and my neighbours here this evening in offering my voice and offering my support in whatever is required to make sure that the lands at Glen Abbey Golf Course are, are saved and never turned into a new subdivision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeMoff. I, I have a question for you. Are you aware that uh, the work that Council's authorizing is, is work that needs to be done in order to determine what the position of Council should be? This is not Council making a decision that you're calling on us to make. Do you understand the difference? Ab absolutely, but what I'm saying is that regardless, we should never develop Glen Abbey. So your view is we could skip the studies and just say no? Well, I mean, I'm not on council, but I'm telling you as a citizen, I don't ever want Glen Abbey developed. I so. see. So I just want to make sure you understand that the, the one of the great burdens of being on council is you have to actually keep an open mind and wait till all the evidence is in. Absolutely. So uh, I, I hope that... Uh, You'll take that into account as you, Luckily, as you uh, campaign. <laughs> Councillor Elgar. Yeah, just a quick question. What did you say is on the website? What, what website did you go to? Yep, so if you go to uh, the actual Glen Abbey website um, hosted by Club Link, they refer to it as a world-famous property and a piece of golf history, among other things. Thank you. Thanks very much. Councillor O'Meara. Is, again, same question as a, as a taxpayer. Uh, do you concur with spending money on these studies? 100%. Thank you. Thank you for the information, Mr. DeMoff. The uh, next delegation is uh, Joe Brandt. Mr. Brandt. Aha, you are there. Welcome. Council looks forward to your information. Okay. With regard to the taxes, I'll make a donation to the city. If you could pass this along right around council, please. Mayor Burton, councillors all, thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight and for bringing the interim control bylaw to our attention. I used to live in Mississauga and I had a sort of malady, a disease. It was Oakitis. It was sort of Oakville envy. And <laughs> I used to bring my soccer team down to play in Oakville at Shell Park. Um, we'd walk along the waterfront, we'd visit the historic houses, we'd see the Great Canadian Open, we'd visit the uh, British car show at Bronte Park. 
uh, Midnight Madness, the whole package, all the green space, everything together. It was always envious of that. Got transferred out of Mississauga, went to Halifax for a while, came back to Toronto, looked at 29 municipalities, and decided the place we wanted to live was Oakville. It was a good choice because the whole package you could not beat in any other place. Unionville, maybe. We looked everywhere. I'm telling you, this was the only choice. Very livable place. Now, the note I'm passing around there is connected to Jack Nicholas. That is official currency of the Royal Bank of Scotland. It's a five pound note. And usually you get prime ministers, presidents, kings and queens, bank governors on currency. You could go and spend this in Scotland. It's a sports personality who's on the note. So if you don't think there's any connection or historic uh, associated with him and this course. Now, I don't know what his third course design was or his fourth or his fifth. But I know what his first was. And so does everyone in the golfing world. Everybody. When the course was sold, it looked simply like the buyer was looking for a hunk of land with little or no understanding of how that fits in to the culture, the historical part of the community. This is not out in some farmer's field. Designating a golf course as a heritage property is not breaking new ground. They already exist, several. There's a couple in Ontario. Uh, Lakeview in Mississauga is a heritage site. You compare Lakeview to Glen Abbey, not much of a comparison. We've had 27 Canadian Opens here. Last time we had the Open here, it equaled the number of Opens that they had at St. Andrews in like 150 years. In the time that Glen Abbey's been open, St. Andrews has only hosted the British Open seven times. Our 27, you will not find that, I think, in any other country in the world. It's truly unique. Also, Roseland Golf Course in Windsor was created as a centerpiece of the Roseland Park subdivision, also a heritage site. And um, that one was designed by Donald Ross, who did Pinehurst Number 2. Everybody knows that. But it was the centerpiece of the subdivision. It was the anchor to where people lived and enjoyed. I had some visitors from Calgary here a few years ago. We went down to play the Abbey. On the 11th tee, I still remember Gary saying to me, I can't believe we're in the middle of the town. This is fantastic. It's true. In my view, this is a green space lying in the sand. There was Richview, it's gone. White Oaks, gone. Sawat, gone. Not yet. Well, not yet. not yet? Okay, fight the fight. <laughs> because there is a line where you, if you cross, I said, I don't want to joke about Mississauga, but this will just be like any other municipality. We will lose part of our uniqueness, part of our culture, part of our heritage, and we really shouldn't. So I would encourage you to pass the interim control bylaw. And I understand that's not the decision the previous speaker uh, was looking for. And I would second his remarks, actually. But I know you've got to do your due diligence. It'll take courage to do that. So please do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your information. We have a question for you. Yes. Uh, Councillor O'Meara. <laughs> you can auction this. It is. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brandt. And well, that is a remarkable note. We don't need that here, but uh, it was a, a, an honor to, to look at it. <laughs> um, but again, just as, as I've asked the other speakers, uh, as a taxpayer in Oakville, are, are you okay with the, this council approving money for, this, for these studies? I've paid taxes here since 2004, and I can tell you by comparison, I am delighted to pay my taxes. They're well managed, so I have no problem at all. If they have to go up a few dollars, I'm fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I, I hope I can offer everyone a little bit of reassurance. We're not planning to, to uh, I don't think we need to raise your tax rate for this. <laughs> um, 
And if if um, if you need a a substitute for saw wet because we're still that's still before the the board. Um, uh, I offer you the Lido as, as an example of a golf course that's gone. And, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not old enough to remember. There may be others. <laughs> uh, the next uh, registered delegation is uh, Chris Kowalchuk. Thanks. Welcome, Mr. Kowalchuk. We Thanks. look forward to your information. Thanks, Mayor Burton, council, staff. Um, I'm not much of a golfer, but I have a long connection to Glen Abbey. We moved here in 1977. My father worked for Seagram's Distillers. And if you ever went to the open in the hospitality suites for about the first 10 years, Seagram's was a sponsor. And it was my job to drop off, I don't know how many cases of Crown Royal into Dick Grimm's trunk. And that's how the sponsorship, and that's how the event has evolved over these years. But I'm here to support uh, Town Council's decision to provide, to pass the interim bylaw to buy time to do the studies so we can make the decision with an open mind. Uh, having said that, I'm, unlike the Fairway Hills community, I live in the Kerr Village community, which if you know uh, a lot of businesses and people who work in the service industry live in our area because it's one of the last places in town you can afford to live. And uh, in the summer when Oakville empties and everyone goes to their cottage, uh, there's a lot of people in Oakville who really rely in the service and hospitality industry on those two weeks that the Glen Abbey is in town and because the people who live in town are at their cottages and it brings, it's one of the few events that Oakville does, you know, all due respect to the, you know, to the Rib Fest and the Jazz Festival that actually brings people from outside of, uh, you know, town to Oakville, fills up the hotels, fills up the restaurants. Uh, unlike Mississauga, we don't have a million people. Unlike Burlington, we don't have the largest Rib Fest. We don't have the Sound of Music. We don't have a park down in the Main Street that gets used the same way. And it is literally one of the only things that Oakville does that brings people from uh, out of town to the, uh, to the town. And it really provides a lot of income for people that need it when they, you know, they're not worried about paying their tax bill. They're worried about paying their hydro bill at the end of the month. So uh, really, I just want to say I, I support the interim bylaw. Uh, I think that most people in town, like the gentleman so eloquently put it from uh, the Fairway Hills community, I mean, it is the Glen Abbey community. Uh, it's basically what defines Oakville. I'm from out west, and everybody I know, the only thing they know about Oakville is that's the home to Glen, the Glen Abbey Canadian Open. So keep it short, keep it sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kowalczyk. Uh, for all of being out west, you've certainly been here since you were a youngster. I've, I've seen pictures of you as a teenager as a lifeguard at town pools. Thanks. Uh, wait, wait. You, you aren't done yet no because problem. you have to Good. answer okay. the Omera okay. test. When I get top paid up my taxes, you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. You've passed the Omera test, apparently. Uh, the next registered delegation is Mr. Paul Rice, who's president of the Fairway Hills Homeowners Association. Welcome, Mr. Rice, and Council looks forward to your information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council, for allowing me to speak tonight. I, too, obviously encourage you to pass the interim bylaw that's in front of you tonight. Um, we, as being the president of Fairway Hills, we're obviously affected immensely being adjacent, located right next door to Glen Abbey. But this impacts more than just Fairway Hills. It impacts the whole town of Oakville, all the residents of Oakville. There's a huge value that's adjusted that's placed on the Glen Abbey golf course affecting everybody. Uh, the growth plan that you guys livable Oakville that look towards, it identifies the transportation management, the infrastructure, what is needed for the urban development of the town of Oakville. We as residents of Fairway Hills have seen this massive increase in growth around our neighborhood of traffic. In just the urban planning and development that's happened to date, we have massive amount of cars that go along Upper Middle, Dorval, surrounding Fairway Hills and the Glen Abbey Golf Course. Typical example I can show you, Upper Middle Pact, we've had cars that have cut through our neighborhood in the egress emergency exit area because they were frustrated with the amount of delay that they were having on Upper Middle to the safety of the residents and kids playing in the neighborhood. So that's an impact on the transportation infrastructure that any development of Glen Abbey Golf Course would have in our future development. One of the things that we should look at is that obviously when we look at urban development 
It must be noted that when they built phase three of Fairway Hills, there was a, a motion and a law passed that they could not have an exit out of Gulf View Court onto Upper Middle Drive. And that was because of safety and the amount of traffic going along Upper Middle to do that. So introducing another 3,000 to 3,200 dwellings and exiting onto Upper Middle, Door Val, which are the two main thoroughfares that it can exit from, would have a major, major impact. I understand that in the planning phase, in the years 2036 and onward, there are provisions for three lanes on Upper Middle. That's not today, that's not in the next 10 years. That amount of traffic on there would, have, would require a major infrastructure change on those thoroughfares, and to do that. When you look at the plan, it looks at metro links, it looks at the infrastructure of transportation, not only for cars, but for people, and bikes, and trails. In doing that, it would have a major impact, in our opinion, allowing it to happen, to go through. When we look at the economic impact of Glen Abbey Golf Course, part of the interim bylaw look at, back in 1999, we brought a business to Oakville, was already established. One of the things when businesses look for business places to invest, we look at many things. We look at schooling, we look at transportation, we look at green space. You look at for your employees with places to have green space. If we simply have urban development everywhere, your employees and people that will invest in the town of Oakville need to go outside of Oakville, need to go outside of the town in order to gain access to those green spaces. A simple urban sprawl does not make for a good town, does not make for a value added to a town. We as business owners and investments, we look to that. We want to bring business, we want to bring investment, as Mr. DeCenzo said, to the town of Oakville. And in doing that, we need to provide business owners and their employees the green space, the, the, the buffer zone, which a green space does, irregardless if it's a golf course or not. It, 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 golf is golf. But green spaces, once we get rid of the land and the green spaces within our communities, we can never get it back. Whether it's saw wet, whether it's other areas. So that economic impact to the town is felt today and in the future. Because we as employers and business people will look at saying, well, we're going to go and invest somewhere else from that economic aspect of it to go in that way. When you look at the economic aspect of Glen Abbey itself, it's one of Club Link's number one courses for tournaments. Corporate tournaments and charitable tournaments bring a lot of money to local areas where those tournaments are held. In assessing, if you were to review the, the amount of tournaments that are held at Glen Abbey Golf Course, and what that economic impact is to our town, to our hospital foundations, to our charities like the Salvation Army and the United Way, a lot of that dollars goes back into our community. And that's a direct correlation to Glen Abbey Golf Course. It's in demand, companies want to do it, and people want to raise money from that and go in there. Uh, you know, golf adds a lot of economic impact to, to ca the Canadian GTP also. In looking at golf, it has a unique aspect to it on a global basis. It brings people from all over the world that come in. As Mr. Brandt put out, pointed out to you, Glen Abbey is a golf course that is recognized around the world. The property is recognized. I have the pleasure of traveling all over the world and playing golf in different places. And that every time I go around the world, everybody refers to Oakville. Oh, Oakville. I'd like to go to Oakville. Where can I stay? What kind of restaurants? Not just the golf. It impacts the business owners, so the Chamber of Commerce. You look at that, it has a direct impact. There is a trickle-down effect to having Glen Abbey Golf Course where it is and to do. We understand that the Canadian Open is not a guarantee that it'll be there. There's never a guarantee that Golf Canada is going to select Glen Abbey as a golf course. But we also know that Glen Abbey is one of the only golf courses in all of Canada that has the infrastructure to handle such an event. And in doing that, puts us in a pretty good position. We get $18 million revenue from that golf event that happens in the week. Will we be guaranteed that? As a council, we're not guaranteed it. But it sure we would not have there if we lose the golf course completely to going that way. In there. Regarding the cultural heritage aspect of the interim bylaw, like I said, land, green space, open areas, and the natural habitat that we see at Glen Abbey, from the deer to all the other, up to the hawks that are flying around, once we lose that, we're not going to get that back. And once it stops, really we as a community will cease to respect that green space land and the buffer and the development of that to go with. We can never get Glen Abbey back if we lose it and go forward, so I encourage you as a council to, to vote accordingly and, to, and pass the, the bylaw tonight 
that gives us time, just like Ronaldo de Senza had said. It's just a time, it's a study. Let's do our due diligence. We understand decisions will not be made, but we want all the facts in front of us. We want educated, we want all the details. We don't want to say, oh, we should have done this, we should have done that. No, let's get it all together. This impact the whole community, not just Fairway Hills. And from that, we encourage you to make all the stunts. And I think it was Mr. Fraser had said, and I was gonna quote, in the words of Clublink, Glen Abbey Golf Club, which welcomes public and Club Link players. So not just a members club, but public access also. Members alike has a grand stage for the golf history, but more importantly, the world famous property. And that's in the words of Club Link. So when Club Link says it's a world famous property, they assess the value of what Club Link is, not only to golf, but to the community and the property. And for that, I ask you to pass the bylaw and thank you for your time. Hey, Mr. Rice, uh, don't run away. You have to pass the O'Mara test. <laughs> yeah. And, yes. and, um, and I think I should ask you, um, uh, I, I, I appreciate that you, I, I hear you to be saying two things, uh, and I just want to make sure that you understand that council isn't making up its mind about Absolutely. Glen Abbey. Yep. Council is only making sure that we have the time to gather all the information we need to be able to make a good planning decision. And we as taxpayers, that's what we ask of you. And we appreciate that the town is taking these steps in order to do this the proper way so that all the procedures and policies, there is a protocol you have to follow in procedures, and we encourage you to follow those so that everybody at the end of the day can stand there and say, yes, the decision was why it was, and these are the reasons why, just like a business. Okay, and now the O'Mara test. Councillor O'Mara? I heard loud and clear, and I, I appreciate that. Perfect. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you for your information. Now, um, as I promised, I'm going to poll the audience for other uh, people who'd like to share information with council. And I see one hand in the back. Um, I don't see the face, but I will. Oh, yes. Well, come right on down, please. And uh, just uh, give, make sure the clerks uh, hear your name. And welcome to Oakville Green. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Karen Brock, and tonight I am uh, representing Oakville Green, um, a conservation association that's been active in Oakville for the past 15 years. Um, our membership is committed to healthy urban living and is committed to um, the protection as well as the enhancement of our green space here in Oakville. Uh, Mr. Rice uh, touched on it, but certainly I think what is important to our organization, and certainly I know it's important to the town of Oakville, is the value of uh, our natural heritage, um, our trees, and the ecological uh, services that they provide. Um, and our organization absolutely supports uh, Council's uh, prudent decision to uh, take the time to look at the value of this uh, open space. Glen Abbey Golf Course is a very large open space and natural area. And yes, it's private, but it is still a community asset. Acting as an urban green space, its contribution to the health of Oakville and its residents is very significant. Um, Glen Abbey Golf Course is a part of a unique ecosystem. And the 16 mile valley, urban river valley, that leads, it's a natural connection to, to Lake Ontario. And um, many of you are aware of a number of studies being done throughout Ontario and Canada and the world about the value of uh, natural connections and again, about ecological services. Uh, this ecosystem uh, protects water quality the water we drink from Lake Ontario. It protects wildlife, it's a wildlife corridor, and uh, it protects Oakville's urban forest. Uh, Council is, is, I'm sure, very aware of the um, uh, threats to our urban forest. Um, this forest protects our health, um, that's the bottom line. So we have to look very carefully at the uh, contribution that uh, Glen Abbey Golf Course makes to our, uh, our urban forest. Um, as well as active living, healthy active living. 
which again is, uh, I think, between the environment and healthy active living, that's m why people live here in this community. Uh, also in the bigger picture of things, the Ontario Green Belt um, has green spaces uh, that make up a vital uh, belt that supports the health of Ontarians. Um, many scientific reports and opinions support the value of the growth and expansion of the Green Belt, not its reduction. So certainly I think that's a motto to hold close uh, to our hearts in thinking to the future, as many people said. We really have to grow our green spaces uh, and not shrink them. And again, uh, once this is gone, it's gone. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think it's uh, so important to, to take the time to uh, make the considerations about the uh, value of uh, Glen Abbey Golf Course, not only as um, a recreational property, as an economic uh, space, um, but as a green space that uh, we really value here in Oakville. Thank you. Thank you. Before you run, uh, uh, oh. Councillor O'Meara. <laughs> <laughs> I, as, as a not-for-profit, I understand that this question might not relate to you, but as a, a, a resident and, and as representing residents, again, uh, are you okay with the tax dollars being spent for these studies? I, I meant to preempt you, oh, Cal well, Councillor Amir. I, I, I had it all, really I had it all, all said in my head. <laughs> I think, again, in the uh, context of the value of the ecological services that this natural area provides, I think uh, uh, the money that the town plans to allot certainly is uh, very small and, and worthwhile in comparison. Thank you very much for your information. Thank you. Um, for a final time, any others who have information for council? Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Just please identify yourself for the <laughs> clerk and council looks forward to your information. Yes, good evening. My name is uh, Jennifer Campitelli, and I'll spell the last one for you. It's um, C-A-M-P-I-T-E-L-L-I. -L -L uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak and to address you this evening. And certainly, um, I'm here, just to be clear, to support the proposal for the interim control uh, bylaw. And I spend some time reading section 38, um, which is the one that obviously is at issue here. Uh, and when you read it in the context of um, the act that it's within, it indicates, or it seems uh, obvious to me that it's to allow the town uh, the time to exercise due diligence and to make an informed decision that's based on research. And whether that be the cultural heritage analysis um, or the cultural landscape analysis that you're going to undertake or the economic analysis or what have you, it's a pushing pause um, so that the town has that time. And it reminds me of in criminal law, where a Crown attorney can ask for three clear days. So if an individual comes up uh, for a bail hearing, uh, a Crown attorney has the opportunity to say, uh, Your Worship, I'd like three days to really get the evidence together before you. And I understand we're talking about three days as opposed to um, a year or potentially two years, but I think we also need to understand that somebody's in custody when this is happening. So what the Crown attorney is effectively saying is, Prior to this Justice of the Peace determining whether or not this individual can be free on bail until uh, they go to trial and decide whether or not they're guilty or innocent, uh, the Crown Attorney wants to collect the evidence to put before that Justice of the Peace so that they can be uh, informed, that they have all the evidence in front of them so that they can make an informed, objective, and a reasonable decision. And it reminded me, when I read this Section 38, I drew a parallel to that because I think that that's what this section is allowing council to do. Council's remaining independent, it's remaining objective, and I understand that, but it's allowing council to have its own evidence before it. And, and I know um, council for Clublink was speaking about how uh, there's some studies that they've done and research that they've done, but I think it's important that council has its own independent research and you've uh, obviously uh, hired somebody to do that for you so that you can make a decision based on all the evidence, all the information that's before you. And it reminded me of that uh, criminal context where um, a justice of the peace, in fact, is asking someone to sit in custody while that happens because it's so very important when you're making a decision, obviously a, a decision that the Justice of the Peace makes in that instance is whether or not someone's going to be into the community and they've been charged with a serious criminal offence, um, or here, whether or not something uh, so significant is going to, uh, it, it alters a town. So you're uh, taking the time um, to have all the information before you before you make that decision. And the section is clear, I think, in its reading that it can't be used in bad faith because it says that um, 
the review a reviewer study must be undertaken in respect of land use policies in the municipality um, within that time frame. And that's what you're doing here. Uh, that's the presentation that you put before uh, us. Um, these studies are going to be put in place. They're already ongoing. They were ongoing even before um, you've asked for this uh, in interim control bylaw. So I think that um, it's not being used in, in bad faith. That's what I would uh, suggest. And that um, Council for Clublink indicated that Glen Abbey was being unfairly targeted. I, I would disagree with that. I think that the fact that these studies are already that they were already initiated prior to this and that they're continuing. I think council should be confident that you're not using this section in bad faith. Um, and that the interim control bylaw is unnecessary. That was also something that uh, council for Clublick had indicated. And um, I think that the city is well within its authority to enact this sec uh, section to ensure that they're being diligent. Um, and I think that that's what's being done here. So I would uh, encourage council to adopt uh, or to um, enact this bylaw. I think it's prudent of council to do that. Uh, it's an exercise of your diligence and your objectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your information. I also pay taxes, so. And I'll, I'll, and turn, you you over, <laughs> I'll turn you over to Councillor O'Meara. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will confine the discussion to table. And uh, Councillor Elgar. Thank you very much, Mayor Burton. Um, I, I, Thank you, everyone and everyone that came to speak tonight and everybody that's sitting in the, in the uh, chamber. Um, I would like to move the staff rep recommendation, all uh, seven of the recommendations. Uh, I do think we need the time to do the studies to ensure that we have all the information and to do our due diligence. So I would encourage all members of council to uh, stand with me and uh, prove this, and I would ask for a recorded vote at the appropriate time. Thank you, Councillor. And you're moving it as amended in yes. the memo. Yes. And uh, uh, let me extend the courtesy of the opportunity to second it to Councillor Lapworth, your ward mate. And he does. So uh, if you wish to pass this uh, uh, recommendation, this set of recommendations, you should rise and remain standing until your name is called. To Wait, sorry, Councillor Dutter. I guess it's this side of the table. Um, your Worship, I'd like to... It's, it's uh, the prisoner's box. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, can't yikes. look at it. <laughs> I guess so. Anyway, I'd be very pleased to support uh, my colleague's motion. Um, having participated in the Heritage Committee for quite some time and seeing the sequence of events that often the most benign application, once we do our due diligence and do our research, all kinds of things come to the forefront, things that even though I was born here, I didn't know about. Um, and it's interesting, I'm not trying to diminish the um, importance of the club link or the golf course or any of the other aspects, but we seem to have sort of glossed over the importance of the, um, the presence within the community even before it was Glen Abbey. And for myself, it used to be called the Upper Canada Country Club, and we used to go there and have brunches, toboggan, and uh, swim. I learned how to race there. Um, as I say, in fact, there was a young gentleman who just started his career, and that was a gentleman by the name of Doug Hennings, the magician. And uh, so there's so many other things that we've only just scratched the surface, so I look forward to seeing the reports. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Meara. I, in in um, in my experience, it's never a bad thing to have more information, and and I have absolutely uh, um, no problem with taking a pause while we get information. And and uh, as many of the the delegates said here tonight, you know, we would be doing a disservice to to the process if we didn't get all the information that that we needed so that we can make the right decision. So I wholeheartedly support my colleagues' uh, motion as well on this. Thank you, Councillor, and, and, uh, and well said. Uh, I don't have to say that now. Councillor Grant? I just want to know if Councillor O'Meara approved the use of uh, taxpayer money to... Uh... <laughs> Thanks. Well, we're, when, we, when we have the vote, we'll find out who else does. Any other speakers? Then, if you're in support of the uh, motion by Councillor Elgar and Lapworth, please rise to be named. Councillor Lischina. 
Councillor Adams, Councillor Grant, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Lapworth, Councillor Elgar, Mayor Burton, Councillor Hutchins, Councillor Giddings, Councillor Duddick, Councillor Robinson, and Councillor O'Meara. I declare the motion carried. And uh, Council, as far as I can tell, that brings us to new business in our agenda. Because there's none of those. And we see none. So therefore, uh, regional reports and question period regarding town boards and advisory committees. Any questions? No. Any requests for report? I'm not aware of any. And therefore, a mover and seconder for consideration reading of the bylaws is in order. Councillor Duddick, Councillor Lapworth. And that's uh, the bylaws as listed in the agenda and as revised in the case of 2016-24. Uh, All in favor? All those opposed? None. Carried. Um, Council, that completes the agenda tonight. It's been terrific working with you, and we are adjourned. <laughs>